if you want to make good decisions about the health and wealth of humans, uh, you need to have some understanding of modern science. You want an educated population. You want an educated electorate. And so part of that is having them get some reasonable understanding of science. And to do that, I would argue you need to have good science education, not pseudoscience education. Welcome to The Shape of Dialogue. Today I have Dr. Nick Matsky on the show. G'day Nick, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi Michael, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Can we start by you telling us who Nick, Nick Matsky is? Sure. What does he do and what the hell is he doing here? Yeah, well that's, sometimes I ask myself that, but um, yeah, I am just a senior lecturer in the School of Biological Sciences. Um, at the University of Auckland here in New Zealand. And, um, and I've had this position for about five years now. It's gone fast. Um, but as you can probably tell from my accent, right, I'm not originally from New Zealand. I did all my, you know, I grew up and did all my uh, schooling in the US, um, including I got my PhD at Berkeley. I guess I've got my t-shirt on. This is the Berkeley Berkelium atomic <laughs> element t-shirt. Um, because that was one of the elements that was invented at, at the University of California, Berkeley, back in the day. Um, so that's actually a real element, is it? It's a real element that they generated in a, you know, in a particle accelerator, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and there's a number of them. There's berkelium, there's californicum, and there's, I think, seaborgium. Seaborg was the scientist who did all this, right? So um, back, back in the day, I think it was Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So anyway, there's, you know, they like to say there's no Stanfordium. Right. Because yeah. Berkeley and Stanford kind of have a thing. And they're like, we invented all these elements and you didn't do any Stanford. So um, but yeah, so I did my Ph.D. there um, and uh, it's in integrative biology and I work in evolutionary biology. Um, and so I've bounced around a bit. I did you know, I did my Ph.D. and then I did a postdoc in, at the University of Tennessee and I did a postdoc at Australian National University in Canberra in Australia. Um, and then I got this job, luckily enough. So I work on. The history of, um, well, the geographical history of organisms and groups of organisms. So have species dispersed around the, the planet over millions of years. Um, we do that with model-based inference, statistical model-based inference. Um, and I also work in phylogenetics generally. So phylogenies are the evolutionary trees that connect all living things. And we use computational methods to try and um, uh, learn that history and then to do additional science with that to try and figure out what are the you know, not just what, what what was the pattern, but what were the processes that produced that. So, so that's all pretty exciting. Um, I can talk about my. I also have done a lot of stuff in science education, um, and so uh, even before my PhD, I was really involved in the uh, U.S. battle over teaching evolution, right, which has been going on for a hundred years almost. Um, and I was particularly involved in the intelligent design fight in the two thousands in the U.S. Um, and uh, this involved, you know, uh, uh, the highest point of it was this Kitzmiller versus Dover um, trial that occurred in 2005 in Dover, Pennsylvania. And this was a uh, uh, actual federal trial over the U.S. constitutionality of teaching intelligent design creationism in a government funded school. Um, and it was a six week trial. And I was one of the I worked at the science education nonprofit and we were advisors on this case. And so I um uh, was one of the sort of science nerds for the lawyers and uh, it was there's been books written about this whole thing and it's very entertaining but so anyway I I know a lot even more than most evolutionary biologists about the history of science religion battles and science and politics generally as especially as it pertains to evolution and genetics I've sort of read up on a lot of that so um, so I had all that history just out of general interest and because that was my area and then I came to New Zealand and figured that would all just be sort of you know, interesting material for lectures and never be relevant to anything. But then I've, I have encountered some some surprising relevance to some modern controversies in New Zealand. Right. Well, what are they? Well, the big one is um, over the last several years, there's been this huge controversy. Um, well, on several different levels, but the, the most direct part of it is what should be taught in science classrooms in New Zealand um, at the especially the high school, secondary school level. Um, and, uh, you know, and this didn't used to be a complex question, you know, introductory science, uh, introductory biology, chemistry, physics, there's a pretty set, you know, core content that, uh, most, 
science classes most places in the world would teach. You know, you got to teach about um, evolution and genetics and DNA and all of that in a biology class and in a physics class, you got to teach about mass and energy and momentum and things. And then in chemistry, you got to teach about atoms and chemical bonds and conservation of mass and, and these sorts of things. Um, and so it was very, very surprising. And what got me, moved me from, you know, there's been a long standing controversy in New Zealand about, uh, or discussion about um, indigenous knowledge known as Mataranga Maori, right? Um, there's been a controversy about that for a, a, um, a long time. Uh, or at least there's been a discussion about it for a long time. What is the relationship between that and science and science education? Um, but what really uh, moved me from being like, well, this can't be that big a deal, can it? Into being, oh, this actually is kind of a big deal was uh, was what I saw in the chemistry uh, science standards in late 2021. Um, in the Ministry of Education science standards, there was a line that said something like, all matter contains mori. Um, and mori, and forgive my pronunciation, I'm I'm not from here, right? Um, uh, but Maury, M-A-U-R-I, right? When you look it up or when you even look in the glossary of the science standards, it said um, Maury is, is a vital, a life force or vital force, right? And this is um, uh, 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 immediately controversial in a science curriculum. I mean, people can have whatever religious beliefs they like, but in a government um, recommended science curriculum, right? This causes a large controversy. Can, we can, can I just about why. yeah? Can we just elaborate on that? Because I, th I think we should add that it's a vitalistic life force that it, it isn't everything. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah, so that's, um, that's the key. That's the key point. Yeah. Yeah. So that is. I'll get the exact text here. Um, uh, yeah. So. The concept of Mori, as expounded uh, by uh, uh, people who are actual experts in modern Maori, right, is this idea that everything has a vital force or a life force, right? So not just living things, as we would term them, rocks and stars and air and everything, right? Um, now, you know, you can't work on that concept very much before you start to see it break down from a mo modern scientific perspective, because, I mean, what is the meaning of life in the first place? Right. There is a quite I mean, there's there are controversies at the edges of these things. But but, you know, basically, it's pretty simple. Um, there is a big distinction between living things, and non living things in modern science. Right. Living things essentially replicate. Um, and there's a bunch more criteria you could employ. But but things that are self replicating. Right. Produce copies of themselves um, are subject to um, birth and death, natural selection. Those are living things. Everything else is non living. Um, and, uh, and the scientific view would say that, um, and this is, you know, not an arbitrary thing. It would say that, you know, the difference between those is that, is that basis, basic replication, uh, phenomenon. Um, there's nothing else special exactly because that replication phenomenon is as shown by modern science, it boils down to just very complex chemistry, right? And so we have basically reduced biology to chemistry and, um, and, uh, and that was a huge and major foundational achievement of modern science. So um, you can disagree with that if you want. It's a free country. Everyone can believe what they want. But it's a big challenge um, to modern science to put that into a, to put a contradiction of that into a science curriculum. Right. So it was extremely surprising to see it. And it moved me very quickly from being somebody who thought, well, you know, what is there really to worry about there? You know, um, Indigenous knowledge doesn't seem like that big of a, a deal. Every obviously every culture everywhere has gained knowledge about their local environment and they've developed skills for surviving and thriving in those environments. That's all fine. Um, you know, is there really you know, and you want to put some of that in a science class? Okay, that's that's cool. That can be interesting to students. That might be especially interesting to students from from uh, certain backgrounds. That's all fine. Um, and that's where I just assumed in the common sense, you know. Uh, if everyone was acting with common sense, you'd say, okay, well, that's where it's going. We don't need to, you know, have a knockdown, drag out battle about, about those sorts of things. You know, even if it's not exactly the way you would teach science in some other country, that's okay. Everybody, there's a little room for different countries to do things a little bit differently. That's fine. <laughs> so that's where I was. And then I read this stuff in the science curriculum. I mean, it wasn't the only instance. It was, that was the most, um, 
dramatic thing, but there were a variety of other worrisome things in the new New Zealand science curriculum that we saw in just, 2021. Just, yeah. just for context, do you yeah. want to articulate what those things are? What, what, what are they proposing to teach to yeah, children? So, um, so and this gets this gets a little bit uh, inside, but the short version of, because you'll have listeners from all over, you know, New Zealand basically has a primary school system and a secondary school system. Secondary school is a lot like high school in the U.S. Uh, it's essentially maybe ages 13, 14, up to ages 17, 18. Um, and secondary school, like most places, is where you would have your sort of specific science classes and things. Um, and uh, uh, the New Zealand uh, curriculum, there's a lot of... The word curriculum doesn't necessarily mean the exact same thing in New Zealand, but but the um, the core thing for our purposes is that there are finishing exams under the government system. It's called NCEA, National Curriculum Educational Assessment, probably. Um, and uh, it has three levels, and level one is essentially sort of ages 15-ish, and then levels two and three are, are more advanced, and they are more for university entrance. Um, level one is more for, you know, if you were planning to go more in a vocational direction or you're going to finish school age 15, 16, and then go do a vocational program and work. Um, that's sort of where level one ends. And so that's kind of your basic, you know, exiting science. And then if you're planning to go to university or something else advanced like that, levels two and three are for that. So um, so NCA one, two, three, they're a big deal because at the end of each year, students nationally do these exams and some of them are graded or marked by their teachers internally, but some of them have external assessments. And those are the things that might qualify you for a particular program at, uni at university. Um, so in 2018, so uh, just in terms of the background of this, this system has existed for decades. Um, uh, in 2017, uh, Labor got elected, and that was when Jacinda Ardern came in as prime minister. Um, and she was kind of a progressive icon, right? Um, in 2018, this uh, uh, refresh of the national curriculum was announced, including a reform of the NCEA system. And this was based on, in part, uh, uh, a variety of workshops that had been done with communities around New Zealand. Um, and, uh, and one of the things highlighted in these commentaries was that uh, 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 Maori communities didn't feel um, that uh, Mataranga Maori was given um, fair status, wasn't, wasn't given sufficient attention in the curriculum. So that was a piece of feedback they got. And on this uh, was built... Sorry, uh, sorry just, yeah. just the, the curriculum in general or the, the science curriculum? Um, I think this was the curriculum in general. Right. So, and I could, I had even had it up here. Um, you know, there's a whole... Uh, yeah, because that's, that's a, it's quite an important distinction. Yeah, well, it was the curriculum in general. So this is the whole NCEA. Yeah. There are NCEA courses for everything, languages and everything else, right? Um, uh, but they did this national feedback process back in 2018, and one of the things they got was this, um, they reported was uh, uh, a desire for um, giving more status to Mataraga Maori, Maori traditional knowledge, um, uh, or indigenous knowledge would be a, another term. Um, which and, which uh, actually, can we just uh, yeah. just touch on that? Which, to be clear to, to people who don't know, is sort of a it's a catch-all phrase for a whole set of of knowledge ranging from the spiritual, mythological, to the pract uh, to uh, you know to the practical, to carving, yes, to weaving, that, to catching eels, that sort of thing. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, it's all kinds of things and. Um, and that term, Mataranga Maori, is apparently a modern term that attempts to codify this. And there's also, a, it, I think it's not accurate to say that it's only traditional knowledge. Um, some proponents will say that it includes modern knowledge that's been developed by Maori, right, um, or built upon traditional knowledge, but now extended. Um, and so, you know, the borders of it may, may be um, a little bit elastic, depending on, on who's talking about yeah. it. Um, yeah. But that's become I the term, you know... Often you would compare it to, uh, uh, there's other terms popular in other countries, traditional ecological knowledge, TEK, um, or indigenous knowledge. Um, they often, most of those terms I would say, include not purely just the practical knowledge or the local ecological knowledge, but they include um, uh, some of the spiritual beliefs, worldview, 
uh, language, history, etc. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, it's knowledge derived from um, pre-scientific communities. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose it's well. Yeah, and you can get into a very important question: what is knowledge, right? Um, but if you're willing to take a broad view of knowledge, knowledge is whatever the communal set of beliefs is. Then you can then you can go with those terms. Um, you know, of course, exactly that issue, if not addressed early, comes back to raise its ugly head later on. You know, what is knowledge? How do you know it's knowledge? You know, um, and uh, and you can get away with ignoring that in certain contexts, but not in a science curriculum, right? So, um, and so that issue comes back up later on, right? Um, but it's been popular in many places, especially often Canada is, is where you see this most prominently um, or taking the lead. Um, and clearly Canadian scholars on this have been influential in New Zealand, um, you know, that, that it is not just something that exists and can be treasured by those communities. It's something that should be promoted by institutions in a country um, is, is a, I would call it a modern um, uh, point, especially by um, activists on the left, I would say, especially by um, progressives. Um, this has become quite a high priority. And, you know, you could see a way in which all of this could work out reasonably well and not cause a lot of battles, right? But that's not, doesn't appear to be what happened in New Zealand. And a lot of it's because of the fundamental, um, uh, as far as I can tell, failure to think seriously about what are you actually doing um, when, this, when this sort of uh, topic encounters modern science, right? Um, and as far as I can tell, it's still, I, I got to make a general comment on the New Zealand scholarly ecosystem on this area, it has failed to deal seriously with this issue. There's a lot of stuff published, but none of it is worth very much, I, I gotta say. Like it um, is not dealing with obvious issues, right? About evidence and what is knowledge and how do you tell what knowledge is epistemology in the classic sense, right? Um, yeah, uh, there's just, a lot of political talk, posturing can, and a lot of gestures is my, my view. Um, yeah, and a lot can of confusion. I just, 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 you know, when you're saying what is knowledge, I mean, there's, I, I say, have knowledge of, say, the a, a mythological knowledge. So, you know, a certain god did this on, you know, to, to mm -hmm. that other god. That is, that is knowledge. But then there's scientific knowledge, which is actually based on scientific principles and which, you know, for want of a better word, um, is true. Where a, yes. a, a, myth, a, myth, a mythological knowledge is just a made-up story. Yeah, so, I mean, you can have knowledge of a myth, right? Yes. It is true to say that a myth exists or a legend exists, and you could accurately or inaccurately describe that, right? Um, just like you can say that you can have accurate knowledge of J.R.R. Tolkien's, you know, works or whatever, like... Um, but yeah, but what usually what we're talking about in science, the point in science is to have knowledge about reality, well, right? Well, going back, um, going back yeah. to your T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. For Kellyham, you know, yeah, that, the, yeah, yeah. I mean that that is scientific knowledge. That is something that actually exists in the world. Yeah, it exists for microseconds because these yeah. um, <laughs> these human created elements <laughs> decay in very yes, quickly. I but know, um, I know. yeah, they but were they existed it, it for a detectable exist. amount it, of time. Um, yeah, it's not yeah, well. Yeah, and that, that's the whole point, right? Like. <laughs> And there's, I see a lot in New Zealand, I see a lot of wishful thinking, um, trying to have it both ways, trying to avoid controversies um, by fudging sort of conceptual clarity on topics. And it only works for a while. And then all those issues you've swept under the rug can come yeah. back up um, you know, it's, once it's, the conflicts start happening. Would you say it's trying to give scientific credence to something that's not scientific? I think that's, I, yes, is the short version. I think, I mean, I think the reason this was pushed very hard into the curriculum. So we didn't, we didn't finish the story. There was this 2018 curriculum reform. There was feedback that said we need, you know, more status for Mataranga Maori, indigenous knowledge. Um, uh, this stuff was written up in, um, you know, they worked on it 2019, 2020. Um, and the standards came out in 2021, uh, the first drafts of the standards. Um, and there's a whole detailed story about what happened specifically with the chemistry uh, standards where this uh, Maori thing came in. We've got several drafts of them. The first draft was a pretty normal chemistry draft. I had issues with it in terms of it didn't seem very ambitious, but, um, but it, was, it had pretty much normal scientific content. Um, the second draft from the middle of 2021 included this uh, uh, 
you know, Mori is present in all matter, or all, all particles contain Mori was the phrase, as well as a number of other elements, right? The word evolution was kind of systematically replaced with the word whakapapa, right? Which in New Zealand, in Te Reo Maori, the Maori language, whakapapa is sort of a general word. It means, it can mean heritage, inheritance, um, uh, uh, it can mean ancestry, right? It's kind of all of those concepts mixed yeah, together. Ge genealogy, isn't it? Genealogy, yeah. Um, and so, you you know, it means a bunch of those things. And, you know, and I don't have a huge objection to if you want to say that evolution is is a, a part of Whakapapa in a sense, right? Because it is about genealogy, um, evolutionary relationship. But it's it's pretty clear if you do that, it's fine. But it's pretty clear that's not exactly what was in the minds of, you know, uh, to real Maori speakers 200 years ago, right? It was it wasn't really evolution. It was um, so you, it's an extension of the language to do that. And I think you do lose something in science education if you remove the word evolution, right? Um, because that does mean something quite specific in modern biology, right? And there's even a tendency. There's a, it's 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 a tendency um, in American schools, right, to avoid the e word evolution. Because people are trying to avoid the controversies that have resulted historically from battles about the e word evolution. So it's a little disturbing to see that in New Zealand. Um, and there were a variety of other problematic elements in this science curriculum. Um, uh, you know, the bit about Mori wasn't just in the sort of text of the curriculum, it was in the learning matrix, right, which is what the basis of the exams is. So there was this question you know, are you really going to have a chemistry exam? And then you're going to ask students on the chemistry exam, like question one, you know, what are acids and bases? And question two, you know, what force, you know, do all particles have, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maury, right? Like you just, it didn't take any kind of extrapolation to see the train crash that was coming, right? Um, so, but we didn't find out about this until late in 2021. But it's clear that the science teachers in New Zealand objected at the time to the draft before it was public. And there were dozens and dozens of critical comments um, that were, you know, done in the behind the scenes stuff at the Ministry of Education. And we now have access to the response from the Ministry of Education, which basically said the policy is um, equal status for Mataranga Maori and Western knowledge, right? And they and they basically said, we see sorry, your objections. West, Western knowledge or Western science? I believe the overall policy is... Uh, Western knowledge, I, um, right. because this well, was about the. So I yeah. didn't use the the key term for uh, the overall policy behind all of this. So in the NCEA curriculum reform, that was, uh, and now you can see it in the 2019 documents. Um, there were seven principles about how that reform was going to occur, and some of them were pretty normal issues like, you know, we're going to keep NCEA level one, we're going to change this and that. But point two was called mana arite. Right, in mana arite, it was mana arite colon equal status from Mataranga Maori, right? And they meant Mataranga Maori, and I believe Western knowledge was the was the overall uh, thing. Now there's you can see there's actually uh, and then Western science, you know. So if you take that and put it in science, it's equal status from Mataranga Maori and Western science. The term Western science has caused its own battles because if you say science is Western, well then um, you know one point of view would say. Well, that just means science is, you know, it's just another culturally specific point of view, you know, and every culture has their own thing. Yeah. That's one well, possible well, implication. Just, on the other I... hand, it can turn the other way and say, oh, well, the Westerners are the ones with the science um, and everybody else doesn't have it. And that can be insulting in its own way. But those two things go in completely opposite directions, right? Yeah. Who are you helping and who are you insulting with those phrases? So Western science eventually got dropped as a term as well. Yeah. Well, um, just yeah. just on that, I did a whole podcast with Stephen Pinker. Oh, yeah. And, you know, essentially, um, you know, what he says, and uh, to me, I, I completely agree. There's no such thing as Western science. It's yeah, just it's... science. And also, I really, a uh, big bugbear of mine is this, you know, concept of Western knowledge. There's just knowledge. Yeah, it's all very you know, problematic, a, 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 right? Um, and, and as, it's... yeah, you know, Stephen said, um, yeah. you, you know, if, everything has to come from somewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, knowledge is knowledge. And it, in a sense, it doesn't really matter where it comes from or who, who came up with it. Yeah, well, I, it. I basically agree, right? It all depends, like... There's, you can argue that there's such a thing as Western literature or Western politics or something. 
and maybe those are knowledges and maybe you know that in that sense there's western knowledge but yeah science yeah, is supposed to be universal it, that's the whole but point right I, I can be chinese and read war and peace and and be totally in love with Tol tolstoy yeah um you know i'm a, I'm a musician um, there is such a thing as Western classical music. Some of the greatest proponents of Western classical music are Asian. Yeah, and so I, and, and and the fact the fact that your you know the the accident of birth doesn't preclude you from um, taking part in in knowledge from other peoples. And so yeah, it's it's just a big bit of a bugbear of mine. I can't. Yeah, I, well, I, I think those are reasonable very points. Very right? um, Yeah, you know, in all these discussions, you have to. I found that there's a lot of reliance on strategic ambiguity amongst people pushing these sorts of changes through the Ministry of Education, right? And so, you know, often things have a, well, it's like, well, if you give it a reasonable interpretation, maybe it's okay, but the same language is open to an unreasonable, or I mean, another reasonable interpretation of the language, but producing an unreasonable outcome that only the sort of really extreme activists would endorse, right? Um, right. And that usually um, can cause lots of other damage to other other things. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of pieces there. But, um, but yeah, the overall policy, right, was this uh, uh, mana arite, equal status for, for uh, Maturanga Maori. And this is clearly a response to the feedback in a sense that at least one section of the feedback said we need more status for Maturanga Maori. And even then, there would have been a way to enact that policy that um, didn't cause big controversies, right? Um because in something like literature or art in New Zealand, it seems entirely reasonable to me that you, you know, if you, you could have a curriculum that would be like all, I don't know, English classics, Shakespeare, et cetera, and you could completely ignore, um, uh, you know, Maori works of art and Maori literature. Um, you know, and I think in New Zealand, it's reasonable to say, well, we don't want to do that. We would like to include, you know, um, uh, Maori art, Maori literature in a literature class taught in New Zealand. Why, why, why not have a whole course on Mataranga Māori? Well, you that, could. So yeah, um, That would seem to be the logical thing. Well, yes. And, though, and those who I'll wanted say, yeah. to do it could do it, and those who didn't, didn't. Yeah. It, um, I mean, where does this go in the uh, high school curriculum, right, um, is a question. Like, I don't have a strong opinion. There might be a way yeah. to pull this off. Um, you... Uh, and then who would teach it is yet another question, right? Um, uh, do you actually have, you know, people actually qualified to teach it? Does it have, I mean, just to, if I'm the guy asking the uncomfortable questions, you know, on this proposal, which in some sense I could I could see being reasonable in, in, in some universe somewhere, um, you know, uh, what is the core content of that class, right? Does everyone agree what Maturanga Maori is? Every, does everyone who's, who's Maori agree? Are there local variants between different iwi, different tribes in New Zealand? Um, and the answer is yes, there are. And you, if you don't read very far, you'll find out that there are some differences. So then what do you teach? Does every local area get a different flavor? If it's NCEA, the whole point of NCEA is to produce qualifying exams, right? So do you want there to be exams on this material? Who decides what the right answers are in these exams? Who marks the exams on and on right so it's i'm not saying it's impossible but it's non-trivial right um yeah right and but the thing is if you're going to bother uh you know making a point of it to put the stuff into ncea for example the government backed curriculum the government backed exams um you actually do have to answer these kinds of questions right whether or not it's in a specific class or not um and this is the entire paradox, well, the, one, of the, one of the huge paradoxes of, of the whole thing, right, which is that um, the phrase that I wish more actors in New Zealand, you know, use or would be aware of would be um, pay to play, right? Pay to play. You, like, if you're going to engage in certain things in uh, science, in education, in government, etc., uh, you you can give it a shot, but you have to. But you're then engaging, and when you're engaging, then you have to answer all of the questions that come along with anything else that's being involved in science or education or government, right? And so these kinds of questions: what's on the exam, right? Who's the authority that decides, right? Is that material um, 
if it's a modern Maori course, right, is that material, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Is it contestable, right? In science, if you think some scientific fact is wrong, you can stick your hand up and say, that's wrong. Here's the evidence that says it's wrong. Here's the peer-reviewed publications that say it's wrong. And then you, people either agree or they disagree, but you, it's, there's, a, there's a forum and a channel for that, right? And there's a way to make a decision. What about Madaraga Maori? Does it have any of that, right? Um, and then who, it, even if it is contestable, who's allowed to contest it, right? Um, you, you could say anybody can contest it, right? That would be one point of view. Um, you could say only Maori can contest it. Maybe only sufficiently authorized Maori scholars can do it. And then you're back to who's who's teaching this. Do you have do you actually have you know, authorized um, people teaching this material, right? And is it a matter of everyone just you know all the students sit there and are just absorb this stuff without being able to question it, or can they question it? On and on and on, right? Um, so pay to play. Like if you engage, then these questions come along. It's intrinsic to the matter, right? Um, uh, and so you can say, oh, equal status. Um, you can have a top-down policy that says you're going to give it equal status, but the devil's in the details, and uh, uh, you know the problems come up sooner or later if uh, if you don't have answers to these questions. So, I mean, Charles Royal, right? Who uh, Charles Royal's a, a noted uh, scholar in New Zealand, expert on Mataranga Maori. Um, he authored the the research sector has a vision Mataranga policy, which is um, many grant applications, you are, it's either recommended or required that you include a statement about what does this research, you know, do to advance Maori interests in various ways. Um, and he, he wrote that policy. Anyway, he wrote an article this year that kind of blew me away um, because he noted after we've had several years of controversy in the curriculum, um, he noted some of these controversies. And then he said something in the article like, you know, maybe we should think about having a sort of a Madaraga Maori standards board or something like this, you know, that could, an authority that could tell the government what the correct answers are on these kinds of questions, right? And, and I, I mean, I respect a lot, Charles Royal a lot, but, but that, reading that passage just made me, you know, rub my forehead because, um, you know, somebody should have thought of that before a national policy was announced and launched and rolled out through the schools, right? Like, it, it wasn't, I think, uh, uh, a huge leap to think that these kinds of controversies should occur, could occur, right? And and that you would have to ha have a way of making these decisions and judgment calls, right? Um, but instead, what happened was kind of a top-down policy was announced for ideological purposes. It was shoved through everything. Um, sometimes it can work okay if you have the right teacher or the right people on the committee and a topic where it you know makes some amount of sense. Other places, it can just lead to a train wreck, which is what happened in chemistry and biology, right? Where the science teachers revolted. They were overridden. That doesn't stop anything. Like, you know, you, <laughs> science isn't an area where you can just declare, right, ah, the policy is this, so this is the truth. That's not how it works. You know, every scientist in their upbringing, right, has the model of Galileo, right, which is, it doesn't matter how high your authority is. If the evidence is against you, right, then scientists can stand with the evidence. And so, and this is why science is always knowing to political ideologues and people in power which is there's an independent source of authority apart from the political system and whoever's in charge at the moment, right? And that standard is evidence and self-consistency and logic and things like that. And, you know, all of us scientists, we, we secretly want to be Galileo, right? It's, you know, that's like great. A, that's the best thing you could be. So, so it's like, it's almost like we're eager to have that, you know, if it comes up. So, so um, anyway, it's quite entertaining, right? When you get a clear case like that, because, you know, all of the sensitivities, you know, many of us were very nervous about addressing anything in this space. I was, you know, I'm no expert. Just um, what, why, yeah. why were you nervous? I'm interested. Well, it is extremely clear, right? Um, after having been at the University of Auckland for a few years, right? It's extremely clear that there's a chilled discussion over these topics, right? And that there, at least a few years ago. Elaborate what you mean by a chilled. Well, um, you can see administrate. You can see the fear in the eyes of the administrators when this topic comes up, right? Just as a gut feeling thing, um, you can see obvious controversies and obvious discussions that any scientist would raise if they were just op operating on their own 
recognizance, you can see those discussions avoided, right? Um, and this is so these are just general general but issues. What what, what are um, they scared of? Well, uh, I think they're scared, and this is a little bit like a lot of other recent controversies in academia, right? There's a politically correct um, point of view on something, and uh, and there's a risk of getting mobbed, right, um, online, or getting harassed by administrators or whatever for having the wrong view, right? Or just getting negative reactions from colleagues who have signed up to whatever the, the politically correct view is, right? So there's a number of topics like this. Gender is one. Um, uh, to some the extent, the trans uh, issue. Yeah, that that's an obvious one, right? Um, yeah. uh, you know, maybe nuclear energy, uh, GMOs are a little bit older topics, right? Um, race is a huge one, right? Um, uh, and uh, uh, and you know, cancellations of historic figures has been a hot one that I've been a little bit involved with because some evolutionists have been on the hot seat, right, for um, sins of the past. Um, Anyway, on, on these kinds of topics, you know, I would say that the kind of progressive consensus um, became very hardened in the last few years after, you know, during and after the Trump presidency. And there was a real, you know, reaction against Trump, legitimately so, but it created a real hard edge to a lot of these issues, I think, and, um, uh, and made it such that if you stuck your hand up and said, oh, you know, I don't, this bit of what you're saying doesn't really seem to make sense. At least a few years ago, you could get your head bitten off, right? And so, um, uh, and there was an extremely famous example of that in New Zealand, right? Which was the listener letter controversy of 2021, right? Which I'm sure you're quite familiar with, but um, just to review it very quickly. Uh, so I mentioned that we found about the Mori in chemistry thing in late 2021, but all of that was preceded by what happened around, I think it was July 2020, 20, uh, 2021. Uh, seven professors at the University of Auckland wrote a letter objecting to the bit that they saw that was problematic in the developing NCEA curriculum. And it was this uh, uh, equal status language, right? Equal status for modern Maori language. And the language they objected to did say something specifically about, I think, equal status for modern Maori and, West, uh, and Western science, right? And so they raised, they, they wrote a letter to the magazine, the weekly magazine, The Listener, and the letter said it was only 300 words, but it basically said, you know, um, you know, science is in Western. Science has all kinds of uh, uh, cultural sources, including the Arabic world, Chinese world, ancient Greece, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it said uh, equal status doesn't make much sense in this space, right? Um, and they said, you know, there are places where there certainly is knowledge that could be considered scientific in terms of local ecological knowledge, um, in terms of uh, uh, skills, navigation, skills of Polynesians and other famous examples, right? Um, but they then they had some line, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it essentially said, but this doesn't add up all the way to, you know, I, I think it was, I think it was um, Mataranga Māori falls short of what can be deemed science. Yeah, could fall short of what can be deemed science, right? Which is, yeah, no, um, there might be ways to say that more diplomatically. Um, and there might be, um, uh, you know, if you get all into the the sort of limited set of examples that are, you know, that are some things that you can sort of treat well in science, right? That, that those bits are science. I think they, you know, they basically would acknowledge that. Um, but yeah, that overall uh, statement, right, was uh, uh, caused a huge controversy, right? Um, now uh, the controversy included, I don't know, a thousand or two thousand New Zealand academics, mostly writing a response letter. Right, condemning them. Um, uh, just just on that, just on yeah. that, I I got Stephen Pinker to go through that. Yeah, and um, yeah, uh, you can see that in in my episode with him. Called yeah, yeah. Science. So yeah, and, 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 and sure, Stephen Pinker. Right, and he was, it, you know, it wasn't wasn't a glowing. Um, yeah, it wasn't a, a glowing commendation, you know, report on on what was said in that letter. Yeah, well, sure, from, the from um, Stephen. Well, I, I imagine he's been, you know, Stephen Pinker has been in the kind of skeptics community for decades, right? And the skeptics community, this is usually scientists, academics who have, you know, who make a point of it to point out pseudoscience or um, other problematic intellectual claims um, out there, right? Uh, uh, you know, Madaraga Maori in science is not the first case where these sorts of battles have occurred. There's the whole creationism thing. 
there's been controversies in North America about indigenous knowledge claims, which, you know, sometimes are these unproblematic things like we talked about, but sometimes are, you know, drastically at odds with what modern science says, right? Um, there's one about, um, you know, how long have humans been in the Americas, right? And that has moved some over the, you know, more evidence has accumulated that maybe humans were here somewhat earlier than scientists originally thought. Um, but there's no way you can say humans have always been there. But there are traditional beliefs that say they were always there, you know, been there forever, that kind of thing. And, and um, you know, uh, uh, you just got to tell it like it is, you know, according to the best evidence of the day. Um, and sometimes that can cause controversy. So and there's a variety of other things like that. So anyway, I believe uh, so one of the letter authors was Michael Corbalis from psychology at the University of Auckland. And I believe he had a long relationship with Steven Pinker in terms of one of them mentored the other one, something like that. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, I'm sure Steven Pinker paid close attention to that. Um, Mike Corbalis, you know, since passed away. Um, but uh, but yeah, the reactions to that letter were, were immediate and strong. Uh, that 2000, some people, you know, signed the letter. Um, the head of school, the, the vice chancellor of the university issued, pub issued commentaries, right? Um, sometimes sort of defending academic freedom. Um, I wouldn't call any of it, you know, exactly a scintillating defense of academic freedom. Some of them did at least, you know, sort of acknowledge it. But they also said things about colonialism and, you know, we need, uh, 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 you know, uh, race, systematic racism and colonialism are these huge problems and yada, yada. And, you know, and, and we condemn all of that. And um, even the, you know, one of the more outrageous ones was the TEU, the Teachers Education or Tertiary Education Union, right, which ought to have the purpose of defending the academic freedom of academics, right? It's one of the top two or three things a union, ought, an academic union ought to do, right? They issued a particularly harsh um, response, which really, really ticked me off because, uh, you know, if, a, if an academic union can't defend academic freedom, you know, and again, they may have said a little bit positive about academic freedom, but basically they issued this condemnatory thing. Now, um, anyway, anyone... You know, like me, I actually, you know, I had heard that this was coming a little, just a little bit before it happened. And I actually was suggested, oh, would you be interested in signing at the time? I was like, no, you know, I basically agree, but I'm not going to get in. And at the time, I was glad that I did, right? Because I was like, you know, I'm a junior scholar in a sense, right? I've only been here a few years. Um, I'm not a professor. All the people who signed this were professors, which are the hardest ones to cancel, you know, if, there, if there's going to be a cancellation attempt. Um, uh, so, but at the time I was glad I did because it did, at the time, I'll describe my own personal point of view. It did seem like maybe at the time that the professor, listener, writers were coming down like a ton of bricks on a minor issue, right? May, at the time I thought, oh, you know, they're kind of picking on this thing that the bit of the NCEA text that they commented on was, was actually about the Maori language curriculum, right? So it was an English language curriculum and a Maori language curriculum to rail Maori language curriculum. And it seemed like, well, maybe you're picking on their curriculum a little bit. And maybe, you know, you could argue about this, but maybe they can do what they want in the in the in the to rail Maori curriculum. Um, you know, maybe they have some different priorities. You know, maybe it's not for us to judge. You can sort of see how that, you know, is a is a possibility. Um, and so at the time I was like, well, you know, um, maybe, maybe not worth getting involved in. Six months later, we find out about the chemistry, Maori and chemistry thing. We discovered that this policy wasn't just for the Maori language curriculum. It was for all the curriculum, for everybody, um, and not just in certain subjects, all subjects, including chemistry, and boom. So then, you know, that completely flips this issue, right, um, for a lot of us science people, because suddenly we are, you know, on the wrong side of a new... Um, uh, you know, political orthodoxy being mandated throughout science education, right? And uh, uh, and that is the time to speak up, right? Um, ideally, it would never get that far. Ideally, the people in charge would know better, but they didn't. So so then, 2022 was you know quite a quite a year of controversy about this. Um, Paul Kilmartin, a chemistry professor at Auckland, he was maybe the first one to really stick his neck out, um, but in an extremely polite and scholarly way. But he gave a seminar in January 2022. Um, uh, to the chemistry department, but a lot of us went along and, uh, uh, you know, and again, when he was introduced by the head of school, 
Um, you could see the fear in the eyes of the head of school of addressing this issue. <laughs> and it was, he was just like, really? Is this really such a sensitive topic? You know, and yeah. Paul Kilmore did. He was very careful. But in the end, he basically said, you know, if Maury is a real force, I want to know the evidence for it. And if it's a real force in atoms and chemistry, you know, it shouldn't just be taught in the New Zealand chemistry curriculum. It should be taught in all the curricula of all the chemistry classes exactly. around the world, right? Exactly. <laughs> Which yeah. is just truth and shouldn't be controversial. Mm. And nobody should be nervous about saying it, that, so, so, right? And the people who ought to be nervous are the people who disagree with that. Like, yeah. the, you know, that's where, it, and it the, the irresponsibility of people who think, that alternative point of view, right? And the people who push that through government, right? That's that's what we should be thinking about. That's pretty outrageous, is what it is. So, um, uh, you know, and just just on, just on that point, um, just for listeners, I did a podcast with Paul Kilmartin, so mm. you can look that one up. And mm -hmm. also, I've done a, a very long podcast with Charles Royal, who you mentioned earlier. Yeah, so yeah. It's it's worth with listening to those as reference points. Yeah, so yeah, so you've probably covered uh, fair bits of this pretty well. So anyway. No, no this, is, this is actually really good. This, I mean, this is what I got you on for, sort of the yeah, history so, of, of what's happened. So if you want, I guess we'll try and finish up the history. But um, so anyway, there was raging controversy. A lot more people got involved then, I think, because suddenly you could really see the hazards here. Um, but yeah, there were controversies throughout 2022. Um, but there was no motion from the Ministry of Education through that whole time. Paul Kilmartin published an academic article in the New Zealand Journal of Chemistry. I did a blog post. Um, there was a, Richard Dawkins and others commented, right? Um, uh, uh, so there was some international negative attention coming towards New Zealand. Um, and, uh, and the political winds in general in New Zealand were shifting. You know, another piece of this was that Labour had gotten reelected in a landslide in 2020 and the peak of the pandemic because labor had quite an effective pandemic response. They'd eliminated COVID from New Zealand temporarily. Um, and so there was a, for 2020 and 2021, I think there was this, you know, wave amongst progressives that like the revolution is now, you know, we're in charge. The voters are with us. Now is the time to push hard, get our whole agenda through. Right. And I think that, I think that took off any sort of caution barriers from a lot of their policies. And, and it didn't have to go this way, but the way it went was crash and burn in the science curriculum. So, um, so anyway, so a lot of people got interested in 2022, and I'm sure there was a lot more behind the scenes. I only get, it's very hard to get anything clear out of what's going on with science teachers and with the Ministry of Education because they don't talk publicly. And we even did some freedom of information requests, and you get back bits and pieces, but you don't get anything like a coherent story. But at the end of 2022, a new draft of the curriculum was announced and a bunch of the stuff had been pulled out, right? Um, including the uh, uh, line about uh, Maury and the, and the Adams. And there was even, um, uh, <clears throat> well, this is a slightly different story. Some of it did remain. Um, and there's a line that's still in the, in the science standards that uh, is pretty uh, wild. Let me just bring it up here. Um, Should have had it ready to go. Okay. Oh, so there in the same document that took Maury out of the main chemistry curriculum text, um, uh, there's a, a bit that says, uh, consider how the physical properties of matter are affected by the relative strengths of interactions between particles, atoms, ions, and molecules. All right, so it's sort of weird language, but it's basically basic chemistry stuff. Um, but in the further discussion part, it says, uh, revisit the concept of Maury referencing giftofthegulf.org.nz, which is a kind of a conservation organization. And it says, this learning can sit beside learnings in atomic theory, right? So, so, and this is a new bit that was stuck in when the old stuff was taken out, right? So this learning can sit beside learnings in atomic theory. If you click on that link, it's got a pretty detailed presentation of, a, I would call it the spiritual view of Maury in the context of conserving, you know, regions yeah. but it still basically has life force and everything well can i um, can i actually read I, i've got it here yeah if you click on that link you get what is moldy and it says moldy is the force that interpenetrates all things to bind and knit them together and as the various elements diverse uh, diversity maori acts as a bonding element creating unity and diversity now um you know i'm just a humble ex-music teacher but to me, that is just gobbledygook. Yeah, I mean, you can see, like, 
like I'm always the the wimpy agnostic, right? I'm not the Richard Dawkins hardcore atheist, but yeah, um, yeah no. But, but you need that is, like if you if you that like is not, that is not science. Well, it's that's just the thing. not it's science. Not science it's, it, it's, right? just, so, it's just it's yeah. just to me that is word yeah. salad, and like, you know why knock yourself out if you want to the, do word salad, but it's not yeah. science. This is the thing. So yeah. why so why are they referencing it in the science well, curriculum? That's exactly right, and they're referencing it because clearly some people working on the science standards are still true believers in what they tried before, right? Um, and people from the top maybe overruled them and took it out, but then somebody stuck it back in as the. Who knows? But that's the obvious interpretation. So, so, um, so, where are we yeah. up to now? So, in, in essence, we've we've had this instantiation of non-scientific concepts into the science curriculum. We've had had you know some pretty high-level academics come against it, um, and then some controversy around that. Um, I've done a whole series of podcasts with some of the world's you know greatest scientists. Um, other people have done lots of work as well. You know, you reference Paul Paul McCart, um not Paul McCartney, Paul, Paul Martin. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so where are we up to now? We've just got this one sort of final reference that you mentioned with the, a link to the gift. Uh, yeah, there's with some that, other with, problematic stuff in the curriculum still. Yeah, what, what is that? Well, so, yeah, there was this attempt throughout the curriculum, right, to sort of include Mataranga Maori wherever you could. You know, and sometimes that's plausible, and sometimes it's like a real stretch, right? And sorry, are you talking about the whole curriculum or the science curriculum? Uh, well, I'm thinking of maths at the moment, yeah. but oh, yeah, maths. the stuff I've looked at is is math, <laughs> is science and maths, right? Wow. Um, and wow. you know, and so the maths curriculum has some weird features. You know, a bunch of it's normal, but but it includes sort of a very long pages long preface about sort of cultural, uh, you know. Uh, safety sensitivity the importance of students you know um, bringing their whole selves into the classroom this kind of rhetoric right which is extremely common in progressive education spaces and none of it's about math right it's just all this other stuff and it's hard to even connect it to math but somebody felt the need to put this long-winded thing at the beginning so you know people so can we, just we've essentially that, but... essentially when we when we go into maths classroom we have to all walk on walk on eggshells well, that is clearly what's communicated. A good teacher would back themselves and ignore all this, right? But yeah. um, so, so uh, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I've I've taught, you know, I've taught music for forty years. Mm. Um, you teach music. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what you would think. Um, but somebody felt the need. It's like this, you know. There's something hammering in the back of the heads of, of uh, you got to say it, progressive education leaders that they just got to, you know. You got to do something in this area, so you got to say something, is, even if it, even if there's there nothing any, really to say about math. Is there any um, evidence to back that ideology up? Oh, I the mean, idea does that it, this does it do? Outcomes? Do we get better marks and all that sort of stuff? Um, I that's these are, I've not researched that in detail. I, I'd be skeptical, right? Because usually, what you see when you look up things claims like this is small studies with enthusiastic teachers and not very controlled. You know, and a huge amount of kind of it, it's you hear similar things again and again. But I'm not an education professor. It would be it's very interesting when you delve into any educational controversy and you try and figure out what the evidence is that you end up just you know going in circles because it's usually yeah. mostly ideology and not a lot of it. it's and it's hard to do. You know, it's it's quite challenging to do controlled experiments. But anyway, yeah. that wasn't even yeah. the main thing in math. The main yeah. thing that struck me was um you go into the example exercises that they have right. And they have one that's, um, you know, is advertised in example maths. This is NCA level one maths. Example exercises being, you know, um, relevance to Pacific issues, right? Um, it's okay. It's a math example that's relevant to Pacific issues. That could be that could be interesting. But you click on it, and it's a trigonometry exercise that's about um, uh, the Purikau, the sort of story or narrative or legend of Maui and the sun, right? Well, so there's myth, a, a myth. Well, this is in the math yeah. curriculum, but yeah, yeah, yeah. but. For listeners who are unfamiliar, there's a, I guess, fairly famous legend, right, about uh, Maui, a hero um, who uh, slowed down the sun by tying a, a rope made of flax, you know, made a, made a rope. He and his brothers made a rope out of flax and tied down the sun and somehow or other that slowed down the passage of the sun across the sky so that they had longer days to do their, their work and stuff, right? So that's a charming story. Um, you know, uh, uh, but, but this exercise has students doing trigonometry on it, right? And students are supposed to work out, you know, how much flax and rope did the brothers have to weave and how long did it have to be, you know, to tie down the sun, right? And you 
think about this for a second and you know what do you what do you do with this like um if if everyone agreed that this is just you know purely a legend and everyone you know and and uh and it's essentially a, a silly story right like maybe everyone could have a good sense of humor about it right and be like yeah okay you know whatever it would be like doing a exercise on some work of fiction right um uh you know and you say okay well if the sun's 100 meters across and if the sun's not the temperature of the sun if the sun is you know just a, sort of a hot rock um and uh then you could figure and you know and the sun is you know one kilometer above the above the land surface well then you could do the trigonometry exercise right but yeah no none of those assumptions is <laughs> has any bearing on reality right uh, and uh 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 you know, and there's further issues, you know, if you take the only way this makes any sense is if you assume a flat earth cosmology, right, where the sun comes up over the edge. So Maui and his brothers can voyage to the edge and catch the sun when it's coming out of the pit or whatever. Um, right. And so so what what do you do with this? And this is in the sort of, you know, exercise, uh, math, doing maths for an important, you know, yeah. relevance to the Pacific uh, peoples. Right. Like, but you're setting up this thing that, you know, if anyone, I, I'd be surprised if anyone actually does this exercise, but because you can just see the chaos that would ensue. Right. Um, but amongst other things, right. It's like either, either you have to treat it as a very silly story and just, you know, write it off as being, okay, this is just a silly legend. Um, but of course that contradicts all of the other rhetoric about, you know, equal status for indigenous knowledge and, treating all cultures with respect and everything, right? Or if you take it seriously, you end up shooting yourself in the foot in a different way because you end up telling a completely impossible story, right? That's at variance with all of our knowledge of the sun and the earth and the distances and the sizes and everything. Um, and you end up just disproving it in a dramatically throw away, right? It'd be, it, it would be, it's, so it's, a, I, I compare it to doing like, it's like assigning students an exercise on Noah's Ark, right? Well, how many that's, animals? That's ex I was going to say yeah. exactly the same you thing. Know, what how happens many animals if we put Jesus in there, or, yeah, yeah. you know, or the Holy Trinity in a mass, yeah. um, in a mass exercise? Yeah. yeah. So, you yeah, know, how many I, animal, yeah, animals on the Noah's yeah, Ark? I, yeah, know, yeah, and even or world, an odd number. In a world where everyone's chill about that, I suppose it could be sort of entertaining, but. But this is but exactly my, well, not my, a chill point, area, right? Like, my point like, would be if right. they instantiated the Noah's Ark into the math curriculum, in an example, there would be an enormous uproar. Sure. Well, annoy everybody, reasons. right? Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't just be us. Yeah. It would be everyone else. The skeptics, the fundamentalists would be annoyed. Anybody well, who takes all, all their the own... All the progressives. All the progressives would be hard out against Oh, it. well, sure. They would be annoyed, too, for their own yeah. reasons, right? Yeah. So, but in this case, this is recommended. It's, it's still on the New Zealand government's Ministry wow. of Education, NCA wow. website, right? And, um, and I've raised it and, you know, you don't get much out of people. They don't want to engage on the issue. But so um, who, who have you raised yeah. it with? Oh, just, you know, on Twitter, basically, and, right, you know, yeah. and, and, and right. talking to people. But, um, uh, you know, I could. And this is the thing. I, I still debate how much am I going to engage on this issue? Because, you know, I can have my opinions. I can do a few podcasts. But, you know, how how big do I want to make this? Right. Like, because uh, it's already <laughs> just following it and doing a little bit eats a lot of time right and you know but, do okay well, let's, to do. let's yeah. address why is yeah. it important that we spend time talking about this why yeah, is it so, important what actually goes into the science and mathematics curriculum that's a great question um and it's important because science is in case uh, science is important um in modern society right all of us like literally physically our actual lives you know, the reason most of us are here is because of scientific advances, right? And most of the modern conveniences we have and many of the modern problems we have, right, are a result of technology based on science, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, it's like Carl Sagan said back in the day. He said something like, you know, we have this paradox where modern civilization is careening ahead, built on the scientific foundation, but not enough people understand what the basis of it all is right um and he said this is a recipe for disaster so uh, you know if you want to make good decisions about you know the health and and uh wealth of humans right um uh you need to have some understanding of modern science you want an educated population you want an educated electorate 
Um, and so part of that is having them get some reasonable understanding of science. And to do that, I would argue you need to have good science education, not, you know, pseudoscience education, right? And so that that's a pretty simple argument. Um, uh, but, and really, it, like, and the other thing that is probably most infuriating, right, is, you know, especially if you're worried about equity, right? If you're worried about um, uh, the fact that people in science professions, um, people in, you know, high-paying technology positions, you know, this will vary by region to region, but often it's the case, right, that it's um, people from wealthier backgrounds, people historically a more white, maybe Asian population tend to have a higher frequency in those occupations, right? If you want to fix that, you got to, you know, get more equity into the initial science education, right? You got to bring people up um, at the introductory levels. Um, if you, you know, if you teach a segment of the introductory level pseudoscience, right? You're just disadvantaging them for those higher levels, right? Um, and so if you're actually serious about equity, you need the high quality introductory science education for everybody. Um, and you don't, you know, need to shave off chunks of the, that population and teach them something else entirely, right? So that's if you were serious about equity instead of just sort of, you know, having rhetoric about it and sort of taking random stabs at policies that, you know, make, make a particular, you know, usually set of kind of academic activists, I guess, feel better, something like that. Um, you know, so, uh, uh, I, uh, so it's particularly surprising for that point of view. So um, now anyway, there are more pieces to that. At, at some point, maybe we'll be able to write an article sort of detailing all of this in a lot of detail, but that gives you the sort of broad outline. Yeah. Um, who knows what's going to happen next? The government has now switched. There was an election um, uh, in late 2023, and uh, uh, the government has now switched to a sort of center-right government. So labor is out. The new education minister is Erica Stanford, and she has... Um, indicated that in general she's got a priority on sort of back to basics education. You would think she would take a close look at this NCEA stuff and, um, uh, you know, start over <laughs> probably. Um, but um, who knows? Institutions and things like ministries of education, right, are these behemoths and turning the ship around, right, is uh, uh, it's like turning an aircraft carrier. So uh, who knows if she's got the. Uh, the vision and the sort of motivation to push hard to, to get everything back on um, uh, a strong science curriculum. I mean, if it were up to me, New Zealand, even before all this, New Zealand had what I would call a weak curriculum, you know? Um, it had a very short, very general curriculum on all subjects, including science, right? Australia, the story is Australia has like a thousand page curriculum, right? That covers all the main subjects including science. In New Zealand, the whole thing was less than 100 pages, right? And there's a lot of local control and, you know, individual schools, individual teachers can do what they want. And that's got some strengths um, because if there's silly stuff, maybe they can just ignore it. Um, but it's also got some weaknesses in that, you know, you depend a lot on the quality of the individual teacher. And again, this raises an equity issue because, you know, usually you'll get better teachers from richer neighborhoods, richer schools, um, that can pay for the better people, and then every place else gets left with people who've got less experience or who's you know, don't have scientific training or whatever. There's a teacher shortage in New Zealand in general, um, and so you know a, a strong basic curriculum could help level the playing field because you, um, you know, you the bare minimum. At least everybody gets the bare minimum. They get the basic stuff. So even teachers who don't have a lot of background in chemistry or whatever can get across the basics. Um, and hopefully that would level the playing field. That's that's a pretty good argument for for a strong national curriculum. Um, but New Zealand hasn't tended to go that way. Um, but that's a that's a huge discussion, right? Um, so anyway, there's a lot of pieces there. But yeah, we'll see yeah. what happens this next year. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe maybe we can have another podcast next year. Yeah. Sure. And yeah. Um, once we know what National is doing, and and um, go from there. Hey, thank you very much. That was really helpful and really sure really great to get the full background and find out where we're up to now. So in essence, it's still concerning that um, the science and I didn't know about the math curriculum, so I'm even more concerned. Um, curriculums are still imbued with things that are non-mathematical and non-scientific. Yeah. But, um, so there's more work to be done. Okay. But um, yep. th thanks very, very much, Nick. And um, yeah, 
Just cool. Really Thanks very much, Michael. Um, no, anytime.